Ωραία. Αρχίζουμε, Αντώνη. So, we are finally are ready to begin. We had some technical difficulties uh, today. No problem. Everything under control. So, we start with uh, the talk of uh, Antonis Nathanael. Uh, you already see the title of his talk on your screens and uh, you here on the screen of our seminar room. Antonis has uh, studied uh, mathematics at the University of Athens, got his bachelor degree there and the same university. He got two uh, master uh, degrees, one in theoretical mathematics and the other one in astrophysics. Then uh, he did also his PhD at the Department of uh, uh, Astronomy, etc., at the University of Athens. It was with the supervision of uh, Yanis Kontopoulos. And then he started uh, a, a series of uh, postdoc positions, first here with us at the Research Center for Astronomy at the Academy of Athens, and then a different position at the University of Frankfurt in Germany. Now he is back at the University of uh, Athens, where he leads a project uh, with his uh, research team. Uh, he is a specialist in magnetohydrodynamics and relativistic hydrodynamics. And he will be speaking today about the light that is still coming from the meter start detected in 2017. So Andonis, you may start. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me again? Yeah, yeah, everything is fine now. Perfect, okay. So really happy to present to you. Uh, the topic, as you can see, is about the first uh, ever binary neutral star merger detected in gravitational waves and electromagnetic, electromagnetic uh, radiation in 2017. So still we are observing light from that event and what uh, happened after the event. So still there are things going on and uh, in this talk, I would like to start first about binary interstar mergers. Uh, I want to convince you, first of all, that it is a really interesting and really important subject because it, uh, it starts from uh, just a merger detection and then you can go to a lot of uh, different areas of research because there are really Really important it is that they are gravitational wave sources and we can detect them, LIGO, Virgo, and the whole gravitational wave uh, Earth based uh, uh, system. Then we were expecting that from a binary interstar merger, a short gamma ray burst will come. So it is really important to figure out about gamma ray bursts, how they are produced, and all the physics that they are concerned. And also, there was some theory. And we expected that after a merger, a binary neutral star merger, a kilonova will occur. So these are the important things that come with a binary neutral star merger. And now more specifically, gravitational wave sources. What can you do? You detect gravitational waves. Here I have three different waveforms. And uh, they come from a binary neutral star merger. So two neutral stars to begin with. For each panel, there is a different equation of state. And if uh, and you can see, of course, that the waveform is very different from one another. The, um, the horizontal axis is the time, and you see that starts from minus 10 milliseconds. So this is the time still the stars are in the last uh, few orbits before merger. And this is the waveform that we can detect uh, with LIGO and Virgo. And at merger, zero time, okay, you see that the waveform after merger is totally different for every equation of state. So with gravitational waves alone, you can say things about the microphysics of the interior of a neutron star, about the equation of state, which is not known as of today. And you can uh, put several constraints only by one detec detection. So you can see that in the first waveform, just to, to have an idea of how, uh, how can you extract uh, information from a waveform just by looking at it. So after merger, you see that there is a, a really quick something happening on in the waveform and then it's just nothing. And this is a signal that the black hole is formed. So first a big uh, hypermassive neutron star was formed and this really quickly, rapidly 
uh, collapse to a black hole. That's why the, the waveform continues like this. Now, in the next, you see that a really big neutron star from the merger of the, the two components of the two neutron stars uh, lived a bit shortly, a bit uh, more than the previous case, about uh, five or more milliseconds, and then collapsed to a black hole. And now we're going to the last case that till 20 milliseconds, you don't see any sign of collapse. So it is really important if we can detect prior to merger, of course, that we understand that something is going on, the merger and post-merger gravitational waves. Uh, right now with LIGO and Virgo, we can only detect till the time of merger because the post-merger gravitational waves um, have different uh, frequencies, go to different frequencies, to higher frequencies, and LIGO and Virgo cannot detect them, uh, or at least they don't have the sensitivity to, to see these gravitational waves uh, at these frequencies. Next, soft gamma ray burst sources. So there was an idea. Ah, first of all, what is a, a, a gamma ray burst? Eh? Here is the gamma ray sky on your top uh, right. And uh, suddenly, a small uh, glitch somewhere in the north part of the sky. You see that it raises all the gamma ray sky, and you can see only this gamma ray burst. And this happens for some milliseconds or some seconds. And this is something that first was observed in the, in the 60s. And still, there are several different theories about, about how this is happening. And uh, a lot of research is ongoing in the last decades also today. There was uh, some ideas in the literature, and people uh, would believe them, that a short gamma ray burst was coming from a binary neutron star merger. So here below, I have uh, a distribution. It is uh, on the x-axis is the timeline, the time, the duration of uh, a gamma ray burst. And you see that we can see a bimodal distribution. So you have a peak less than two seconds and another um, after two seconds. So for all these bursts that had a duration less than two seconds, it was the idea that they were coming from a binary neutron star merger. So a detection, gravitational waves, and the short gamma ray bursts at the same time could be a smoking gun that we are in, in the right path for this. And of course, uh, more about uh, the jet structure after glow emission, etc., etc. So all these are can come only by one detection, and this a lot of research was ongoing for uh, for some decades for these subjects. Also, it was expected that when two neutron star uh, merge, a lot of uh, neutron-rich material uh, is destroyed somewhere in space and we are expected we expect that from rapid uh, neutron star, uh, neutron uh, capture sorry our process nucleosynthesis will occur and then all these heavy elements that will be produced they radioactive their radioactive decay will give this emission and because the first study saw that this would be 100 or 1000 more than a nova uh, they were named as a kilonova and if you can see in these uh, elements here, all these yellow elements uh, uh, below are expected to come from merging neutron stars. So all of this can come from a binary neutron star merger. Now, the outline of my talk from now on, uh, I will start by saying what we knew before this first detection in terms of mostly uh, numerical uh, studies, numerical relativity simulations, or uh, general simulations and what we knew before and what we expect uh, to observe when something like this would happen. Then I will discuss what we observed in 2017 about this specific uh, event, GW170817, and then I will go to implications to nuclear physics, gamma ray burst physics, and of course cosmology at the end. Now, if we put two neutron stars here are on, on your left two neutron stars with their magnetospheres. They are right now, at this moment in time, uh, 100 kilometers apart. But you can see that their magnetospheres already interact. And this can give you a precursor, so an electromagnetic signal prior to the actual merger itself. And then when the two stars merge, 
you see that the whole magnetosphere would uh, dissipate and give some uh, electromagnetic signal, give some energy like this. So this is a specific case of the prompt collapse so that no uh, big neutron star was born or a disk around the neutron star. And this is the case for this. But the main point for this slide is that prior to merger, we expect some electromagnetic radiation. Here in this plot, you can see uh, the timeline before merger. So this is analytical and semi-analytical till we arrive to the actual merger. And you see that uh, the electromagnetic luminosity is on the vertical axis. And it goes on and on and on as the two neutron stars come closer and closer as the orbit uh, decays. And then this zoom in is exactly at the peak of the merger. And this is from a numerical simulation, the one, uh, the one that I was showing before. And we can get how the dissipation of the, uh, the magnetosphere will give you uh, this energy. And you can now put down constraints of uh, which is the distance that you can expect to see this precursor, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is the electromagnetic precursor, and this is the prompt collapse scenario. So when, uh, as I said before, the hypermassive neutron star, the star that is produced after the two neutron stars uh, merge together, collapses really quickly to a black hole. Now, in order to study all this from gravitational wave sources, uh, from binary neutron star mergers, to study the waveform, to study equation of state, it is typical, and this is how uh, the community is doing it is numerical relativity simulation. So we put two neutron stars uh, in the last orbits. They continue to emit gravitational waves and they come closer and closer together and they actually merge. This was the, the beginning in order to study the waveforms that then we would expect to observe from LIGO and Virgo and, uh, and also to see how, what will happen in the whole merger procedure. So I will leave you to see this video if it wants to play. Okay, this is the large or orbits. And you see that the, the stars will uh, start to touch each other. What we can see here is the equatorial plane and below are two projections in the x, y and x, z. And if you can see when the two neutron stars merge together, let me pause a bit. You see that a hypermassive neutron star, there is a really huge core in the middle. You can see also the projection here in the uh, YZ plane and the XZ plane. And you see that a lot of matter is expelled, is dynamically ejected away. And all this matter is really uh, uh, what is important for, for the kilonova to occur. So by these studies, we can uh, simulate and we can study let me play it again and I will be talking. We can study and we can make expectation of what is the lifetime of this big neutron star that will be born. And all this hints to different equation of states. And uh, we can extract, of course, information about the interior of the neutron star and the neutron star matter that we will see. So let me go back. So from all, of from all of this simulation, the status in the community is the following. When the two neutron stars merge, a hypermassive neutron star is born in the middle. Okay. Around this huge neutron star, there is a huge disk of matter from uh, the, the layers of uh, the two neutron stars that merge. You can see, as you could see before in the video, you can see that all this matter is ejected dynamically. And even after the dynamical ejection, you expect neutrino-driven winds and magnetic winds. The difference in colors is because different parts of this ejected mass will give you a different kilonova uh, signal. Because here, uh, from matter that comes from the disk, you expect a lot to be more neutron rich. So this will give you uh, uh, a higher efficiency in the neutron capture and uh, our process nucle nucleosynthesis. So when this hypermassive neutron star collapsed to a black hole, okay, what we expect and what we have seen in numerical simulation is that a lot of matter uh, forms a really huge disk around the black hole. And in the middle, you see that a magnetized funnel, a magnetic structure is built in time 
Of course, these are really huge simulation. And if you see at this time, these arrows show a 0.5 C speed for this, uh, for these fluid elements. So yet there is, this is not a, a relativistic jet of a velocity close to the speed of light, but you need enormous amount of uh, numerical resources to run this longer and longer so that you could expect to see this relativistic outlet we born. Something that I would like you to remember for uh, the next parts of my talk is that from numerical relativity simulation, we see that the opening angle of this jet, so the half opening angle of this jet, is from 10 degrees to 15 degrees. And you can measure this through magnetization from where, from where the, the, is the boundary of the jet. So now when the jet is born, if we go to the right, okay, this jet now is trying to dig and uh, drill through the, the ejecta so that it can some, somehow pass through this ejecta so we can see the light from this jet. Now, when the, black, the supermassive black hole collapses, all this blue ejecta component ceases to exist and only the disk continues to give you some matter, uh, some ejected matter, and this is the relativity, uh, relativistic jet that is born. Now, after the relativistic jet drills through the ejecta, then you expect at some point a, brom, a prompt gamma ray emission, which will be the, the short gamma ray burst. And then as this outflow continues, um, inside the interstellar medium, this will pile up a lot of matter in the shock front, and this will uh, gradually uh, decelerate, and it will give you this afterglow. And by the way, this is the light that we are still observing as of today, and we will go to the observations uh, later. So now, the timeline of merger. Before merger, we expect that we will see at least one or two seconds of gravitational waves before merger. So this is the expectation due to the masses of the neutron star, the range of masses that we expect. Then after merger, we would expect from all these um, studies that the hypermassive neutron star will be born and the post-merger gravitational wave waveform will last for from zero seconds, depending if it will collapse fast maybe some seconds, maybe it will last forever and will stay alive as a um, hypermassive neutron star. Because now in this talk, I will focus only to the scenario that at some point this hypermassive neutron star collapses to a black hole. When it collapses, also the gravitational waveform will quickly uh, stop and nothing will happen later in terms of gravitational waves. Now, to begin with, before the merger, we expect an electromagnetic signal, signal from the interaction of the two magnetospheres. Then the post-merger phase is really important for the matter that will be ejected, dynamically ejected, and also neutrino-driven winds, magnetic winds. When the black hole is formed, you expect a gamma ray burst to come, okay, that you will see in gamma rays and most probably also in the X-rays quickly after the gamma rays. Then in one or two days after this event, you expect a kilo nova to show up. So all this matter that was expected during merger and after merger will continue to produce these really heavy elements, which um, radioactive decay will give you this emission in one, two days after the actual merger. And then this afterglow that I was discussing, this jet that will continue to propagate into the interstellar medium will give you, will give you the afterglow and you expect that this could be observed even in more than 100 days after merger. So if I go again to this, precursor would be expected in the X-rays. Okay, this is the mass ejection phase. Then we expect the gamma ray burst, gamma rays and X-rays. The kilo nova you expect to be to observe it in uh, UV optical and infrared. And then the afterglow you expect to see, uh, to observe radio, X-rays, optical, etc. So, in the first ever event that was observed in gravitational waves, of course, we saw the gravitational waves pre-merger and exactly uh, the point of merger. But we didn't see anything after. As I said before, we don't expect from light and Virgo to have uh, uh, to see or to hear gravitational waves in these frequencies. And we didn't see, of course, anything in, gra in terms of gravitational waves after that. We didn't see any precursor signal in the X-rays. 
Okay, but we saw gamma rays exactly 1.7 seconds after merger, we saw gamma rays. But after the gamma rays, we didn't see a continuation in the next race, which was expected, but we didn't see. And then later on in one, two days, we see all, uh, all what uh, was expected from a kilonova, UV optical and infrared. And we saw how this changed from the first day to the second. And of course, we are still observing the afterglow in radio. And the last point, I think in 1,600 days or more was in the X-rays. So go now to observations for this specific event. Below, you can see this is the frequency of gravitational waves. The x-axis is the time, the vertical axis is the frequency, and you see as they come closer and closer, the frequency uh, goes up, increases, and then here is exactly the point of merger. Above this frequency map, this is the Fermi uh, satellite observing, uh, searching all the time for gamma ray bursts, and this is the, the gamma ray background, at least in these uh, specific energies. And then 1.7 seconds after merger, we had a gamma ray burst. Okay, and this is uh, in the sky, you can see that LIGO Virgo. It is really important to note here that when LIGO and Virgo, both of them saw the event, we knew that it was somewhere here. So this is really important for uh, Earth-based uh, observatories and space-based obse uh, observatories to turn to this exact position in order to find the galaxy that this is coming from so that we can expect to see the kilonova emission because for the gamma ray burst we have these satellites satellites that make blind searches they they try to look half of the sky or more but to see a kilonova you have to 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 turn your telescope exactly to the exact position and find uh, the host galaxy in order to expect to to see to make this search for the for what will come the emission that will come in one day two days uh, more and more so now if i go to the previous uh, picture that i was showing before first we had the merger at time zero and then at 1.74 seconds it was the gamma ray burst so in this time of 1.74 seconds you need the hypermassive neutron star to collapse to a black hole you need a relativistic jet to be formed and the relativistic jet to drill through the ejecta. So by computing all these different time scales, we arrived that the collapse time of the hypermassive neutron star was in one second by following two different lines of arguments. One for the expected kilonova emission that we observe in order to have all this ejected mass, you need a, neutron, a hypermassive neutron star to be alive for one second. And also, you need this 0 0.7 seconds in order for your jet to drill through this jet. So this result is really important in order to go to nuclear physics, which is what is coming next. So what I'm showing here is a plot of the central density of the neutron star um, versus the total mass of the neutron star. So these are sequences uh, of, uh, of neutron stars, of different neutron stars. And you can see that this line here below, okay, is for non-rotating configurations. So this is the MTOV, the so-called MTOV. So the maximum mass of the non-rotating configuration. For a specific equation of state, you can go up to a maximum rotation, and this is the maximum mass for the uh, maximally rotating neutron star configuration. And this, uh, in all these green, uh, regions are uniformly rotating. So if you add also differential rotation, and for the hypermassive neutron stars that are born after merger, uh, differential rotation is sure that is, uh, is going on inside the interior of the neutron star, we expect that these configurations can have even more mass. So if we thought that this is the place that the merger gave us, the product of the merger, so the hypermassive neutron star was here initially. By losing angular momentum or losing also the differential rotation, we would expect this path to come here and by crossing this line, uh, collapse the black hole. By this argument, you can try to find at the time that it collapsed to a black hole, uh, what is the maximum mass that it can have. And from this, you can have the maximum mass 
of the non-rotating configuration. So by adding all this, we arrive to this posterior, um, to this uh, probability distribution function about the MTOV, so that the MTOV is between 2.087 to 2.3. So these values are really important now uh, for uh, nuclear physics, because when you build an equation of state, this will give you as a byproduct, as a result, the maximum mass. And by this, you can constrain equation of state. And I have a later slide that can give you an idea of how this can be done. So in order to put all the pieces for this specific event together, we found the MTOV, but also we found how much mass is ejected. And this is the, the total ejected mass. So this green region comes from the kilonova emission. So when they see an emission from the kilonova, they can constrain how much mass was ejected. So in our model, this is the distribution of this mass inside the limits. And this is the gravitational waves. The first uh, distribution is the in spiral gravitational waves, uh, which we observed. Then this, the second distribution is the post-merged gravitational waves and the total gravitational wave is here. So here we don't have a limit from the detectors themselves, but this is an upper limit from numerical relativity simulations. So from the numerical relativity simulations, we have seen that the total uh, amount of gravitational waves is inside this region. And this is what uh, our results gave us. So now to go back uh, and say how we can use our results. So this is from a previous study of 2018. You can see that all the red regions are uh, cut it out. Ah, first of all, to say this is a mass radius diagram. This is very, uh, I mean, everyday life for people doing neutron stars. So uh, for each specific line here, this is a specific uh, equation of state. So for each equation of state, you can have, depending on the mass of the neutron star, you can have a different radius and you can have here the maximum mass of the neutron star. So if we give a constraint in the maximum mass of the neutron star, we are giving exactly this peak here. But this peak here can uh, very quickly take out a lot of equation of state. So this is an old plot from 2018. By putting our results here, you can see that most of this equation equations of state that at this time were expected maybe to be realistic now are, uh, are uh, all uh, rejected okay because the upper limit will go to 2.9 only maybe this green one here will stay alive now to continue after this first event this is the only part of this talk that i will say about a different event it was uh, quoting from wikipedia a cosmic collision of a first ever 2.5, 2.6 mystery object. So it was a black hole of 22 to 24 solar masses and another object of 2.5 to 2.6 solar masses. So there was a big debate in the literature and in the community if this 2.5, 2.6 was uh, the heaviest neutron star or the lightest black hole. Uh, here is the gravitational waveform. Uh, waveform on the right and on the left this is from numerical relativity uh, simulation uh, as we expect the gravitational wave to count so what we we wanted to argue is that since we already have observed a binary neutron star merger okay in uh, 2017 whenever we use a new equation of state or we put a different limit to, M to MTOV, we have always to go back to that event that we are sure that there are two neutron stars and check if this new MTOV can give us um, a, a good solution to that uh, observation. So on the left now, I have the same uh, exercise that I was showing before, but now I put the MTOV mass to be, to be 2.5 solar masses or 2.4 solar masses. So I would allow for the neutron star to be even um, heavier in the non-rotating configuration. But letting the neutron star be heavier in the non-rotating configuration cannot give you the amount of ejected matter that we observed in this specific event. 
and also give you a total amount of gravitational waves much much more than the numerical relativity upper limit of course this doesn't say that this is wrong uh, it just says that in order to have more gravitational waves than we see in our simulations is that we are neglecting a really important uh, process of losing uh, somehow angular momentum uh, in the post-merger phase because the, the in spiral phase is really very well constrained from simulations and post newtonian approximations going to gamma ray burst physics so as i said before we have this black hole we have seen this in numerical simulations but these are really expensive because here you evolve also the space time itself uh, in every time step and these are really really expensive numerically so what to do with this our solution to this problem is take what we have from numerical uh, relativity simulation take the last outcome so the black hole and the disk around and go now to a GRMHD simulation so to a general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulation so now here we have a black hole so this is a static space time we don't need to evolve the space time anymore and now we can play without a grid and put a much higher grid much further away I mean in order to see the production of the jet on the left I have a hydrodynamic jet and I'm just showing it for reference because this is really uh, uh, a lot of people do it in the literature uh, I need to mention here that the hydrodynamic jet is put by hand as an initial condition so you put initially um, uh, uh, a jet with a certain Lorentz factor an initial luminosity initial density distribution and then you inject the jet inside your disk or your ejector however on your right initially you just put the black hole the disk and the magnetic field and then the jet is produced uh, self-consistently so this is a series of 2d simulations that we did what is really important to mention is that all the mhd simulations have a 10 to 15 degrees opening angle whereas all the hydrodynamic simulations have three to five degrees because this is the opening angle uh, that you put by hand Okay, another important point to mention is that uh, a big part uh, of the jet close to the axis has uh, a smaller Lorentz factor and less energy than the, the jet, the whole jet itself. Another important thing that we see in numerical simulations is that if you put the, the realistic MHD jet, also a magnetic wind will follow, and all this uh, matter here is ejected matter that comes even after the hypermassive neutral star has collapsed to a black hole. Whereas if you do a hydrojet alone, you see that it is really, there is really minimal, uh, really small amount of uh, ejected mass. So this ejected mass can be really important for the kilonova itself because it has a big contribution to the red kilonova, but also will have a really big influence to the late time afterglow and this will come also later. We made the parametric studies for all different spin parameters, different uh, disks around the black hole, and all the time, uh, all of the jets have a similar structure. But I don't want to stay more to this. Now, what is the standard afterglow model? Okay, when you have this jet drills through a star or uh, the ejecta from a binary under star merger, when this breaks out from this whole mass configuration you expect the gamma rays then you, this hits the interstellar medium this decelerates and you continue to see the emission uh, as it says here radio emission but also x-rays and optical so the viewing angle is really important for the structure of the jet and uh, this is from a study of Nakar and Piran they have gathered all together the information okay about uh, from different groups all of these are hydrodynamic simulations uh, in the panel below it's the jet opening angle so what is the angle of the jet okay and above is the viewing angle so the angle of the observer all of these you see that start from 25 30 degrees and go down to 16 degrees what is really important to note about these three red dots on the far 
uh, right is that after this uh, study came out was a superluminal motion detection so the centroid the flux centroid in a specific frequency was observed in 75 days and then again in 230 days and this motion could be explained only by these three models okay so uh, in the literature we were sure that the viewing angle was 16 degrees of course i say again that these are uh, these are hydrodynamic simulations so the jet opening angle is three degrees that's why the viewing angle can go to 16 degrees now uh, we did some 3d three-dimensional grmsd simulations again the setup is the similar from what i was saying before we take uh, the mass distribution and we mimic it from a numerical relativity to a GRMHD simulation. So now the metric is static, the black hole is there, and then you leave this with magnetic field and this jet is born. Uh, far left is the magnetization, in the middle is density, and you can see the big amount of ejecta that comes with the jet, this MHD wind, and on the right, the Lorentz factor. So on the left, is the observations the afterglow the observations in radio and x-rays so these observations you see that the first observation came 10 days after the actual merger and continued till 1000 days so this is the model of the afterglow emission from our own 3d uh, grmhd jet here we are also constrained the vlbi detection this super luminal motion i would say rather well but the viewing angle that we are uh, finding because the structure of an MHZ jet is totally different from a hydrodynamic jet is a, view of a, a viewing angle of 35 degrees now if i take the plot that i was showing before for the viewing angle from all these uh, studies in the literature you see that these three models that that uh, take into account the, the vlbi uh, constraint go to a viewing angle of 16 degrees whereas our model that also takes into account the vlbi constraint goes to 35 degrees uh, totally different values and these are really important for what will come next for cosmology now what is also important is that from our jets you have a huge component of ejecta all this mass is ejected so what you expect is that first the jet going into the interstellar medium okay we'll give you all this emission uh, this is the peak that uh, you already see the whole of the jet and then continuously and gradually the jet is uh, decelerating but then when this part of the outflow this mhd wind that uh, travels with 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 uh, times the speed of light will catch up this shock will give you a refresh of the shock and will give you more emission and this is what this is what we uh, had published in the beginning of 2021 and showing that we would expect at some point this flux to rise and this is not the influence of the jet because the jet continues to decelerate but it is the the influence of this um, mhd wind that uh, has just uh, cut up uh, the shock front so this is the expected radio signal from the ejecta and again the structure of this if it's not only one point but two three points can really tell you a lot about the mhd wind uh, so in mid 2021 there was another observation uh, more than 1200 uh, days after merger that was showing that the flux now in the x-rays is rising and for us this model can really easily explain uh, this increase in the flux so now for the last part of my talk, going to cosmology and how can you do cosmology from one, uh, from only one event alone. It is really important to note here that you are not using anything uh, like prior knowledge, knowledge for supernova, knowledge for anything else. So everything here will be gravitational waves and electromagnetic radi radiation from this specific event and not using any calibration from other events so from the gravitational waves alone analysis and this is posterior distributions 
on the vertical axis is the luminosity in distance and the uh, this x-axis is the viewing angle you see that there is a degeneracy between the two so by the gravitational waves alone you don't have a good uh, constraint on the viewing angle so by using the gravitational waves alone LIGO in Virgo gave us uh, this new uh, estimation uh, new in terms that it is totally a different way from all the other estimations that exist as of today and gave us from for the Hamble constant 74 plus minus you see that the errors are really huge and this is uh, due to this degeneracy in the viewing angle now if you could somehow know the viewing angle better and better you can see that this would yield uh, a far better constraint in the luminosity distance which straight translates to a better constraint with lower errors for the Campbell uh, for the Hamble constant so in the literature what was what exists is by these specific three models that i was showing before these models that give you a viewing angle of 16 degrees you can cut the distribution so behind in orange is the distribution coming from the gravitational waves and now if you use they say here vlbi and light curve if you use this model okay you can cut this distribution here in the 16 degrees and then you can have a, a far better constraint uh, for the Hubble constant and this is constraint that uh, it was published 16.9 um, plus minus or something so as i was saying before for our model that yields a viewing angle of 35 degrees which is a magnetohydrodynamic model and of course we expect neutron stars to have magnetic fields and especially strong magnetic fields and uh, another point to make is that if we assume that there is a hydrojet we don't know how this is produced and all these hydrojets in the literature as put there by hand but by using this mhd jet okay uh, you can cut this distribution this posterior distribution from the gravitational waves in a totally uh, in a in a very different part so you will have um, a very big change in the luminosity distance and the hubble constant and again here we use also the afterglow light curve and the vlbi constraint to do this and if you assume that uh, as a prior uh, the the distributions the posterior distributions from the gravitational wave signal you see that uh, it really goes down to this small part in this uh, two parameter space and uh, the humble constant that we get from this analysis from the mhd jet is uh, larger than the hydrodynamic jet is close to 73 to 74. now if i put this plot from this is from the holico uh, collaboration you can see here on the left are the values from the let's say from the far probes the planck estimation and here on the right this Suze experiment is from the supernova and they have this uh, these differences that I suppose we all know for cosmology and they are so different now if we put the value from the hydrodynamic uh, the estimation from the hydrodynamic modeling this goes here if we put the value uh, from our modeling this would go uh, here closer to the SUS result and the other results below so just to recap what I was saying there is a lot of research going on ongoing even before merger even before this first uh, detection so i was saying before and i want to say it once more uh, prior to merger we expect some electromagnetic signal it wasn't observed and even if it is observed we can only know some things about uh, the magnetic field configuration and the magnetic field strength then it would be really important to have the post-merger gravitational waveform this will give us a lot of information about the equation of state and also the lifetime of the hypermassive neutron star then uh, a gamma ray burst was observed so we know that at least some of the short gamma ray bursts uh, the family of the short gamma ray bursts uh, comes from binary neutron star mergers also now we know that the kilonova will always come 
from a binary Anderson merger and the afterglow that we are still observing. If we continue to observe uh, the afterglow, if we have one or more, one or two more points from what I was saying before, it would be really important that we can constrain also the structure of the ejecta, which can be combined with the observations uh, of the kilonova and can enrich more uh, the possible outputs from these observations. And that's it for me. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Adonis, for the nice talk and a very nice presentation. So let me put here the, this view. And uh, it's time for questions. Yanis wants already to ask something. How do you start your relativistic MHD chat to put the field? What field do you assume there? And same question, uh, your central uh, Star, is it differential rotating? I mean, if you have any magnetic field there, will it grow very much to form a jet? So, how do you start your jet? Have you heard the question? I have heard the question. One clarification How I start the jet when I have only the black hole and the disk, or in the previous case? Both. What? what? Both. Both, okay, okay. So for numerical relativity uh, simulation, this is the configuration that you start. You put two dipoles, okay? You expect a dipole for each field, for each uh, neutron star. And this is how you start a numerical relativity simulation. And from, from this configuration- This is vacuum or MHD? this is vacuum outside the star and inside the star it is uh, ideal mhd similar to this and this is what you get at the end so you start by a dipole configuration and then you arrive to this configuration a disk and black hole and uh, magnetic field this is the one question i suppose <laughs> The second, for the simulations that we start. So the jet field here is the vacuum field or, or no? After merger, there is no vacuum. Here, here in the, in the right, uh, there, uh, yes, these white right. lines, the white lines. Yeah, yeah, so here there is no vacuum. So everything is filled with matter. This is just okay. So okay. for visualization purposes that they okay. have left. The field lines like this. So this is not vacuum. You have matter everywhere from the destroyed uh, neutron stars. Uh, in the other case that we model, that we put a disk, okay, in a black hole, we put uh, inside the disk from again from the numerical relativity simulation, we put a poloidal component and a toroidal component uh, inside the disk. Uh, both of them are large scale components. So it is. Uh, they, they have a, a structure. This is the initial field that, that we put here. Okay, okay let's move on. Uh, uh, first of all, from, in, from here, are, is anybody else who wants to ask something? If not, then we go to Demos. You want to ask something? Please go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I have several questions here, but let's take them one by one. Yes. So, uh, I did my own estimates and I, from my own gamma ray burst model, I found some angle close to uh, 15 degrees rather than uh, 30 that people were talking about earlier, but that's another story. Uh, so why we all of a sudden now the angle decreased from 30 to to 20 to 16 to 15 uh, you mean about the community what the community well yeah all of a sudden i i remember at the beginning everybody was talking about 30 degrees based yeah. on the gravitational radiation uh, signal and so on and so forth now all of a sudden you have three groups here that say 16 degrees well you you insist it's still 30 so what's the difference now yeah 
sorry about this it was really i want to show you what i want to show you i don't remember ah here oh what i did yeah okay so uh, what what happened uh, for the literature now yes and are these these um, estimations these 16 degrees are from hydrodynamic jets all of them so what happened was this vlbi detection wait a minute How Hydro <laughs> that from hydrodynamic jets I mean they put something by hand and they say it has to be uh well they've seen the, the my understanding is they've seen now they resolve the blob right they resolve the shock front that's my understanding uh, the, from the your talk I, I wasn't aware of that the the observation is just a, a point a point source but it tells you the velocity now in some sense it tells you the velocity of and the angle the and the angle as a combination of velocity and angle yes but the angle you don't know it you will put your model and you will find the angle okay so they've seen they've seen the velocity because they know it's uh, 230 days and this they see the angular distance from uh, the center yes assuming that because you don't see the hole of the of the of the sock you see only the flux centroid so you yeah you assume that this is the same here and the same here yes this is a big assumption behind right and by this constraint so they've seen the they've seen two e epochs right they've seen the this the blob moving uh, position of the blob in two epochs that's what something, they've seen. Yeah, something like this. Yes, in I two see. different epochs, exactly. They see uh, the blob, but uh, but they cannot resolve the image. So, no, the image, of course, they cannot resolve. Yes, That's they, right. they assume that it is exactly the same. Eh? That this the emission comes from the exact. So, is that yeah. still relativistic? At this point. Yes. Uh, uh, somewhere here, uh, no. In whole well, I mean, they, they measure the velocity, the, the separation as a function of time, so they can calculate the velocity. Yeah, yeah, the velocity that was detected was superluminal. If this is what superluminal, yes. well, then comes my next question: How is that going to ever catch up with the uh, ejector, which are subluminal, to create that excess emission that you guys claim that it will appear? No, no, but but this motion now is going down. This excess emission that I was showing yes. comes if you see 1000 days later. Yes, that's right. So is it still now it's is what's the Lorentz factor now? Less than one? It's uh, one? Yes, yes. Now from from the Z, yes, it has decelerated really a lot. OK, it's, uh, it's, well, it's Newtonian. Uh, well, wait a minute. For the gel to decelerate, it has to pile up material exactly that's a parameter so what how much material has piled up i mean it's out of the vacuum right there's no yeah yeah you you assume yeah i, I can dig the, the paper i mean yes you assume a, a density for the interstellar medium n equals one roughly uh no i think not what do they assume I mean, I think... obviously this is very crucial right because it will tell you when it this uh yeah, yeah. when it gets uh, gets subluminal gets the Lorentz oh, yeah. factor less than two. Totally. Yeah. Uh, uh, the density of the interstellar medium and the energy that you have in the jet. But these are two parameters that uh, you have. To, okay, we to... don't know the parameters. So now this bent in the flux is because became sub uh, became sub relativistic or because the opening angle is such that it's one over the uh, uh, separate. Now we see the entire opening angle of the blob. Exactly. So in exactly the peak of this, we see the whole jet. So and then that means that it's so all it's continues to be uh, relativistic. Somewhere here, somewhere here. Oh, yeah. Goes... <laughs> yeah, OK. Somewhere between 100 days and 1,000 days becomes sub relativistic. 100 and 30, 100, I would say, before okay. here. It comes all right. And of course, that depends on the uh, that depends on the uh, uh, on the, on the ambient density. Fine. Yes, yes. I mean, after you have the model, you do Monte yes. Carlo simulations. This is how we also do it. Actually, we use a genetic algorithm, but okay. it's the same idea. You play in the parameter space okay. to so, find. But the, the ejector now move all over the sub relativistic. The ejector cannot move more than C over three. So, how can I ever catch up? So, the ejector now move 
with 0 0.3, let's say, the speed of times the speed of light. Okay. From the beginning. Yeah. They, they, they move like this. And they have all the way in front of them clear to continue and catch up. At some point, for sure, they will catch up. I mean, uh, the jet... Uh, What's the velocity uh, of the uh, outflow of the bob? It must be way below 0.3. Yes, after 300 days, for sure, it is uh, way below. But it's, it's still relativistic up to uh, up to 300 days. So 300 days, this moves no. with C, the other one moves with C over... Th no, no. I, I said from 100 days to 300 days. I don't know. We can check uh, the model and well, I can tell clearly you... Clearly, exactly. at the peak, is still relativistic. So up 150 yes. days, the velocity is uh, C. The, the peak is at 100 days. Okay. The, so beyond that, the velocity is still C because presumably that bend has to do with the fact that you see the overall. Yes. The, the, okay. the, fir, the peak here and the first small bend here, yes. Yes. So to be. Uh, but when you continue now to decrease, uh, some, yes. I mean, we can see the model itself. Yes, at some point becomes non relativistic. But non relativistic yeah, means it's necessarily C over. Well, so then how does the, the, the velocity drops as a function of time of the jet? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. I mean, this is the outcome of the calculation. I can check and I can tell you. OK, but I mean, this is presumed to be an analytically, but that depends crucially on the ambient density, right? Yes, of course. OK, of course. all right. Yes. That's uh, changing the all ambient right, density, of course. <laughs> the question we'll... is, uh, well, uh, yes. listen, if they all of a sudden they see this uh, light curve following the blue curve you have, they can I cannot argue. I will yeah. not be able to argue. So we have to wait and see. That's not an issue. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, but you, you, you convince me that uh, the uh, ejector will catch up with the jet. All right, yeah. that's that's fine. Okay, we they, they may catch up with the jet. Uh, what is the 1.4, 1.74 seconds? What is that time scale? I mean, why the gamma ray burst is after uh, one and a half seconds? So what we are arguing is two different times. I mean, it's not only you, it's many people. Most people argue like that. And I'm trying to understand it because I argue differently. But as I said, yeah. it's a different story. So let's assume that at zero time, OK, here is the merger. Yes, yes, yes. And then you are building uh, this hypermassive neutron star. Yes. This hypermassive neutron star is alive here. I don't have it but continues to eject matter. So for our study, we had two different lines of argument. As long as the hypermassive neutron star is alive, it is ejecting matter. If it is ejecting this blue kilonova here, I see. which okay. will stop when the black hole is formed, this blue kilonova. Yeah. So because we observed the, the blue kilonova, we know how much mass was ejected in this blue component. So yes. from, from this, it's, what we uh... did, a tenth of the solar mass or the twentieth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Zero point zero uh, three, I think. Oh, okay. A thirtieth of the solar mass. Zero yes. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is the value of the yes. solar mass, yes. And now uh, the argument is the following. We put uh, I mean analytically, uh, you can uh, assume uh, I mean uh, a power law or a law for how much is ejected when this is alive. Yeah, fine. You, you can tell how much from the material you see, right? You can tell exactly. how much is so ejected. You can say that the, the hypermassive neutron star was alive for one second, because if it was alive for two seconds or more, we would see more in the blue kilonova, more mass. Yes. So it has to collapse at some point. And then the, the different line of argument is that the, the GR became 1.4 uh, point uh, seven four seconds, and you need some time when the black hole is formed and the jet is formed here to drill through the ejector. So when the jet is drilling, the the jet head is not moving uh, with the speed of light, so it is trying to drill through the jet. Yes. And when it breaks out, then you expect to see the gamma ray emission. Hey, okay, Yanis, now will come here and tell me. So it goes from. Lorentz factor of uh, 1.2 to Lorentz factor of 300 well, as, as soon as it comes out? As soon as it breaks here, yeah. 
Yes, then it can really cut the Lorentz factor that you want. It does not have time to accelerate. I mean, it accelerates on time scales short compared to the uh, to its lifetime, to the 1.47 seconds. I mean, usually in gamma ray bursts, they say you start with some uh, energy in there, uh, isotropic in general. If it's directed energy, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do it. I mean, <laughs> but you cannot put all the momentum in the forward direction. The natural thing is to have isotropic, something is isotropized because it propagates through a medium which is heavy and eventually breaks out. And you have now this material that has to accelerate from Lorentz factor of 1.2. It's relativistic. It's somehow, somehow it has more energy than its rest mass, somehow. And now it breaks out and everybody's telling us that basically it's Lorentz factor increases linearly with distance before it reaches a hundred. Now, if that's the case, then I've been arguing with many people, why we have gamma ray bursts? Why they burst? I mean, if the material starts accelerating from one to a, a, a thousand sometimes, you should see it gradually increasing. And I don't see why we see all of a sudden a single burst. So and nothing afterwards. Only one thing I, I would change to, to the whole uh, yeah. the way you took the arguments is that as it is drilling, the jet from the black hole uh, till the point you have the jet head, it yes. is relativistic. Then it smashes on the... Oh, well, wait a minute. It's relativistic in velocity? In velocity, yes. I mean, you if... If you put a jet drilling some material, you inject the jet. Yeah, they, uh, that's the whole idea of the gamma ray burst. It drill through the star. Well, drill yes. through the star, nothing happens. I mean, it propagates slowly and then breaks out. I agree the, with you. The jet head propagates slowly. Everything yes. behind the jet get, uh, the yes, jet It has head. energy per unit mass, presumably more than one, presumably. Assuming that you cannot have mass penetrate the magnetic field because it's shielded by the magnetic field. Uh, uh, let me make a uh, let me make a, a parenthesis here. I don't want to attack you. Okay, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> trying to understand <laughs> no. because I hear all these things in the literature, and now is my first chance I can talk to somebody face to face who's done these calculations. And I'm trying, and this is similar to what other people are doing. Okay, Adoni. I'm trying to yeah. simply understand in my head. Uh, I may be appearing as being a little bit uh, uh, if, if uh, aggressive. To... I, it's not I, I want to be aggressive against you or anybody else. I'm trying to understand no, no. the differences. Uh, yeah. What is going on here? That's because I was I assume that once they have the neutral stars, they effectively you send out a lot of material relativistically, and therefore. This uh, kilo nova can never catch up with a burst. That's my understanding. But the uh, issue is, uh, we have to understand this issue. So one, one eventually, point. so the burst, the 1.7 seconds has to do with the bursting out of this relativistic uh, material, which is give, driven by the rotation of the torus somehow, right? Yeah. Uh, now, Yanis has uh, had uh, discussions with uh, Komisarov on that. So. Yannick, can that accelerate immediately to Lorentz factor of a thousand? But Antonis said again and again that the jet is already relativistic. It, it is just drilling. It is drilling, it's, yes, okay. But drilling, if it's drilling, if it's drilling, means that its velocity is not c. It is c. It, it, there is a backflow of the jet. If you drill, you, you move fast, but the drill moves slowly. That doesn't mean that the jet moves slowly. Is that correct, Antonis? The jet is very fast. Has, you said, yeah, the, the jet right? head. The jet the, head. The head is moving slowly. slowly, but the jet is pushing on the head with a very high Lorentz factor continuously. And then it falls back. It, there's a backflow around the jet. Backflow, 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 till it drills through. When it drills yeah. through, it continues out with 300. You have that backflow. That's all relativistic material now, right? So it breaks out. You have to see radiation from that. But. Another point, because we are extending the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to really push it. If, if you want to discuss uh, in person, face-to-face, uh, -face, buy me a ticket to NASA and I'm coming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will do that, Adoni. Yes, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. We should do that. 
The only so, problem is we're still closed. So we have to wait until, <laughs> until the COVID uh, is opening, uh, the opening of the, but anyway, okay. So then, so the 1.7 seconds has to do with breaking out from this material. Okay. And the lifetime of the hypermassive neutral star, you need both. Yes. Uh, okay, that's fine. Well, let me let somebody else ask a question. <laughs> well, okay, we have uh, we have booked some time for questions. So until uh, Antonis is coming over there, <laughs> you can have this discussion. Thank you, uh, Limos, for the vivid discussion. I have checked before. I don't see anybody else wanting asking something. Let me check again. That's why I let you <laughs> continue. And since we have the time. So it is, as I said, if, uh, if I am mistaken, please uh, uh, just uh, speak if one, I don't see any raised hand. Okay. And, uh, and Jan is also is satisfied. So let's uh, thank then Donis again. Thank you. And uh, uh, for those that uh, follow our seminars, there will be another one on Thursday already. Okay, not don't wait until next week. So thank you again and uh, bye bye.